Welcome to a fantastic edition of Rebellion's educational series. We're going to look at the transaction cost of trading today, specifically microprice, with Senior Research Associate from Cornell Financial Engineering, Sasha Stoikov. Sasha, thank you so much for coming on today. Thanks for having me. Well, the pleasure is ours. So how much do you think an average Robinhood trade loses versus maybe just an average interactive broker's trade? Uh, well, it's kind of a complicated question and maybe I should explain a little bit what micro price is to sort of frame things. Um, so um, the idea behind uh, computing the fair price of an asset has always been you know, a big part of what algorithms do, you know, based on many inputs, they sort of spit out, you know, this is the fair price. And if the fair price, according to a trader is above the ask, then they should be willing to buy at the ask. And if it's below the bid, they should be willing to to sell at the bid. And so, so this concept takes into account things like, you know, the bid size, the ask size, and um, what's happening at a high frequency in the order book. Um, and in order to, um, so, so that's essentially think of the micro price as the fair price of an asset at any point in time. And well, so what about just taking the simple median of the bid and the ask? Uh, yeah. Know. So the, the mid price is, is considered a, a, a pretty good benchmark for the fair price, but what we know, so what's interesting is that when you really zoom into the micro microseconds and and sort of the 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 price ticking up by one cent or down by one cent at, at this scale uh we see that actually the some imbalances in the demand and the supply can affect the the probability of the price going up or down so in other words if your bid size is uh you know 500 shares and your ask size is 100 shares we know there are a lot more uh, buyers that are interested in at this particular moment in time. So in that's a great point. You can't just look at a simple bid and ask there, you know, you've got such a, a deeper perspective, such a deeper mountain of information, uh, you know, if you will. So, right. So, so in fact, something that people do in the industry, it's sort of like the, the, the least well hidden secret of high frequency trading is that uh, if you do a weighted uh, average between the bid and the ask, i.e. Uh, using the size at the bid and the size at the ask as weights, mm -hmm. in fact, you get a, a much better prediction of what's going to happen next. So if the imbalance uh, between the bid and the ask is, you know, 0.9, what I mean by that is there's 900 shares at the bid, 100 shares at the ask then there there might be a, a higher than 0.5 probability that the price will go up and that's in, in essence that's what the micro price is now once you've found your fair price uh the question of transaction costs is how much are you let's say paying more than that fair price uh when you're buying and how much are you um you know are you paying when you're selling uh at the bid so so those are, in essence, so you, you were asking, I think you were interested in, in Robin Hood yeah, or interactive it, brokers. It makes me wonder with, with Citadel, you know, they, they, they want the order flow, but aren't they trading on both sides of the book? It, it... Right. So for example, uh, um, an end, a retail in, trader, let's say I, I'm a retail trader and I'm on, on Robin Hood and I want to buy I have no idea at this moment in time whether there's more shares on the bid or shares on the ask. I don't have that kind of granularity in the app. Um, so what I do is, well, let's say I'm a buyer, so I buy. But I, it could be that um, the imbalance of the book is actually tilted the other way, which is more sell orders and very few uh, buy orders. So by, by buying immediately and by Robin Hood routing to, let's say, Citadel, and giving Citadel the option to take that trade or to not take it, um, essentially some all this expertise about what's happening at the top of the book is delegated to to Robin Hood. So, so if, it, if, if Citadel sees that for whatever reason, there's a ton of institutional interest in you know, AMC that day, obviously they'll want the AMC order flow to sell it right. off. 
right? And I think more more specifically at the microscopic level, uh, if they receive a buy order when the imbalance is is uh, is low, so let's so what I mean by that is I want to buy and there's a thousand shares at the ask and uh, one sh one share at the bid, uh, and I'm a buyer. Citadel will see that order and it's, it'll say, oh, wow, I'll definitely sell that. Everyone's selling at this price. So they will go sort of in a way, not front run these orders, but essentially they'll make that decision when it's opportune for them to take the other side. And in another scenario, like let's say the bid size uh, is a uh, thousand shares and the ask size is just a hundred shares and I want to buy. Uh, Citadel might say, "Oh, at that ask price, no thanks. I'm not. I'm not going to trade, and it's going to be routed to the market, which, in many scenarios, the price will tick up, and I may have to pay an extra cent for for that trade. So, in other words, the 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 um, uh, the companies, um, sort of the the electronic traders like Citadel, are able to have the option to take an order or not to take and." Typically, their infrastructure is so fast and so good that they they can make that decision pretty rationally and over time uh, make money. But we're talking about fractions of the bid ask spread here. We're not talking about um, you know charging three or four cents over the bid ask spread. No, so there's still margins. It's just the question is how much they make and. You know, also, if they're being opportunistic about it, they have the opportunity to make more by, you know, waiting maybe an hour or two as the, the price fluctuates. So I guess coming up with a specific price for a specific amount of you know, capital loss for a Robinhood uh, investor is tough. Would you open a Robinhood account? Have you considered it? Uh, no, I, I have an interactive brokers account, but uh, I don't. Um, so interactive brokers has one advantage over uh, Robinhood is that you can really code algorithms in Python and have them trade live. So it, it, it is a bit more of a quant, uh, quant oriented platform, but, um, but I don't have any experience with, uh, with Rob using Robinhood. No, as I a, haven't used it either. Interface. I've been using interactive brokers for over a decade now, since 2010. I love it. And, you know, like you said, it's very quant friendly, whereas, you know, Robinhood, you know, you're kind of accepting that you're among the retail flow and you're not looking to make specific amounts of money. And, you know, you generally want to own Apple for six months or a year or two. And so, you know, you'll take your economic loss to Citadel or whatnot and, you know, move forward. But, um, you know, moving back to, to microprice, Sasha, can we use microprice movement to determine you know, the longer uh, price forecast of a stock? No, so I would say that the the imbalance at the bid and the ask are things that are, uh, the, the effect of that signal or that alpha is very short term. So we're talking uh, within a few seconds, uh, either the price will tick up or tick down or stay the same. Oh. So, so that's the kind of horizon that this signal has. Oh. Uh, what I find fascinating about the, um, the high frequency signals and specifically the imbalance uh, of the order book is that it's here to stay. It's not, you know, many, um, many signals that we see, let's say, at the daily time scale or at the hourly time scale um, or monthly time scale. Those are signals that uh, very often when they get discovered by researchers, let's say that and they publish results. Uh, like, you know, papers in the 70s on momentum or, you know, mean reversion papers that, that came later in the 80s and 90s, uh, what you find is that often the effects that researchers find disappear over time because, you know, the market is a sort of a destructor of signals in that way. Now, in term, when you go at the high frequency timescale where, um, where, for example, the signals like the imbalance of the order book are structural in a way like they're not going to go away it's not because um you know uh more buyers will always cause the price to go up more sellers will always cause the price to go down no no we're talking about of course much shorter distances people don't realize there's a whole other world here the famous trader mark fisher went on cnbc and slapped the desk and said 
you know, 10 trades just happened while I slapped that desk. People don't realize how quick things are. And, you know, Renaissance has their four, you know, basketball courts, five stories tall of just intraday data. So it's amazing how much is out there that the retail investor doesn't understand. And there's a whole other world of high frequency, which you really kind of, you know, unmasked uh, for our show. We haven't even touched high frequency once on the Rebellion series. We um, touched on it lightly with Irene Aldrich, but this is uh, the first time. So, uh, you know, really, you know, fantastic episode we, we've had here. Uh, you know, our shows are short, generally, you know, 10 to 12 minutes. And so really very educational time with Sasha Stoika from Cornell Financial Engineering, talking GameStop and Microprice, and we'll have Sasha back on the show very soon. And uh, uh, everyone check out Sasha's work and his app, um, Want to tell our viewers about your, your app quickly before we go here? Uh, yeah, sure. So uh, I've been researching recommender engines specifically applied to music. And so, you know, the, your viewers might think, oh, my God, this has nothing to do with finance. It's completely different. But what's funny is that at the um, at the heart of a, an algorithm that predicts uh, what you might like or or dislike, there's something very binary about it. Most people's approach to music is I, you know, I hear it, I like it or I dislike it. And they're able to sort of vote for with their no, 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 like and dislike is a very, you know, deep, uh, you know, kind of very, you know, valleys. And, you know, there's a lot, there's a lot of, uh, you know, geo there. And so right. it's funny you mentioned that because rebellions, original deep learning was for uh, facial recognition. My partner wanted to build a dating app, and he felt that people really just fell in love based on facial uh, recognition. So mm -hmm. if you vote a face is a 9.9 .9 and he can get 100 rankings of you on faces, he can pick out the prettiest girls for you that you will fall in love with. And so that's actually what we all um, essentially made into our uh, Bayesian economic learner. Uh, so anyway, yeah, very fantastic. Uh, and I see a lot of parallels with, uh, with so. stocks at the microscopic scale, which is, um, you know, at the daily timescale, we talk about returns and, you know, uh, risk and rewards. But when you look at the very microscopic timescale, only two things will happen. The price will go up or it'll go down. And and that, in effect, is uh, is sort of what a trading algorithm will do, but also a, mu a music recommendation algorithm. And, you know, you, men you mentioned dating app, this, the app, um, the picky app that I've uh, developed, which you know, people might want to download on their phones, essentially asks you to, with your gut, vote whether you like or dislike. P-I-K-I, right? P-I-K-I, yeah. P-I-K-I, yeah. No, we'll do, we'll do another a musical show where we have, uh, you come on, talk about Picky App. Sure, so, I would love to. Anyway, have a great day, Sasha, and uh, stay safe during these crazy times. Thank you, you too. Okay.